Welcome to everybody who's popping in. We're just gonna wait one more minute and then I will introduce our guest speaker for today. So just get settled in. And if you um, notice you have a question, uh, so we're gonna be sharing some book ideas that are, we ourselves are reading or looking forward to reading in the chat while we settle in. Um, so we'll get started in just a minute. Hi everyone, welcome to our Read Across America mini webinar series coming from the University of Arizona Global Campus Engagement Committee. I would like to welcome you here today for our first session. Please remember our webinar series will take place today, tomorrow, and Thursday, all at two o'clock mountain time. Each day we will be featuring one guest speaker followed by a short presentation from a, our guest librarian, Sally Nye, who will share new and exciting resources and books that you can check out as we celebrate literacy this week. We will be recording all of our sessions and housing them on our open ed resource page, and we will share the link for that in our chat. Um, that resource page holds many exciting and useful resources and links for teachers and parents alike. You will find a special section there just for Read Across America and all of the great resources that we share during this webinar series. Okay, so our guest speaker today is our very own Lisa Sims. Dr. Lisa Sims is the lead faculty for the Forbes School of Business and Technology's web and mobile app emphasis. She's also the lead faculty advisor for the University of Arizona Global Campus Women in STEM Club. Before joining UAGC, Dr. Sims worked in software development for various industries for over 20 years while founding a small business technology company. With as busy as she is, she also managed to author eight books. Today, Dr. Sims will share with us how science, technology, engineering, arts, and math can help, help us to discover creative and innovative solutions to life's questions and problems. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and pass the screen over to Dr. Sims to get started. Thank you, Michelle. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. I am excited to talk to you today about STEM and STEAM in our everyday lives. And just to give you a little background, a little bit more, uh, as Michelle mentioned, I am the lead faculty for the Forbes School of Business and Technology's mobile app emphasis. And so most of what I'm going to be discussing today comes from a place that I am very familiar with, and that's STEM and STEAM. I get excited about it. I have two small boys, ages five and nine, and every day we do something that is STEM or STEAM related. And so these things that I'm going to talk about today can be applied not only in the classroom, but also at home. And so I just want to kind of give you a view into how STEAM fits into our everyday lives. We don't really think about it. We just kind of go about our day. But STEM and STEAM are incorporated in everything that we do. And so I want this to be an interactive and engaging webinar. So the first thing I want to do is to kind of get you to think about something. And that's kind of what STEM does. And so here we have a blue robotic arm. So I want you to take a look at this. So what does this robotic arm, this space shuttle, and 
this young man with these virtual reality glasses on all have in common? And you can go ahead and put it in the chat. And I'll give you a few minutes to put it in the chat before I proceed on. Let's see, Allison said technology. Anyone else? Let's see, innovation, engineering, technology, innovation, science. That is true. All of these are correct. They involve some aspect of STEM. And we don't really think about it, but they really do. And with robotics being on the rise, I know with COVID, a lot of restaurants are even using robots to replace servers that they could not find human personnel to find. So we're seeing a lot of that. And so we've got science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. So we're STEM and STEAM. And one of the things I like to do is just kind of give us a definition of what STEM actually is. We know what subjects compose STEM and STEAM, but what actually is it? And so I found this particular definition on livescience.com. And so it just basically says that STEM is designed to encourage discussions and problem solving among students and developing both the practical skills and appreciation for collaboration. And I'll also add some other things. It also encourages critical thinking. It encourages us to think outside of the box. If we see a problem, not to look at it as being able to be solved in a one dimensional way. And it also really gets us thinking about how technology and science and everything else can be used to actually solve that particular problem. And here's a quote from the National Science Foundation that I thought was very good for this particular session. And it says to succeed in this new information-based and highly technological society, students need to develop their capabilities in STEM to levels much beyond what was considered acceptable in the past. And I'm just going to kind of share my age here. I am a child of the 70s. And so I think about my childhood, and I'm just going to use a broom as an example. A broom back in the 70s was not just a broom. A broom could be a baseball bat. It could also be a horse. It could be anything that our imaginations could come up with. And so back then, we didn't have the internet like kids have nowadays, and they can't pull themselves away from their mobile devices and whatnot. We had to actually go outside and play and discover the world that was out there. And so STEM is one of those areas where it also helps the imagination. It helps us to be able to imagine the possibilities, not just what's in front of us, but what can come in front of us. And so that's just kind of one of the ways that I look at STEM. And also STEM helps us in many ways. And there's some interesting facts that we want to think about for STEM when it comes to children. And it helps to build their confidence in their abilities. We all know that before a child feels confident, we have to assure them that they can do certain things. And once they tackle those small things, then they get that confidence to say, hey, I can go on, I can do some much bigger things. And if you're like me, I'm a visual learner and STEM and STEAM are geared towards those who are visual. And then it also prepares the children of today for the technological advances that are not only here, but are coming. And I know we all know uh, with our children, it seems like they came out of the womb being able to use a iPad or an iPhone and little babies, they, they even know how to use it. So they just have that tenacity and they just have that knack for technology. It just seems like it's already instilled in them. 
And one of the things too, is that it encourages girls to step outside of the traditional educational path. Now I am one of the faculty advisors for the Women in STEM Club. And so this really touches home for me because we want to encourage more girls and women to actually venture into the STEM careers. Of all the STEM careers, women make up about 27 to 28% of those careers. And that's a small percentage. And so we really need to encourage girls at a young age that, hey, robotics is not just for boys. And we want to encourage the boys too, but also girls to let them know that, hey, it's not just for boys. You can do this too. You can be a scientist or you can be a astronaut. So we have to put those positive images in front of our girls and our boys so that they can imagine themselves being in one of those roles. And so STEM helps us to investigate. If you're like me, when you see a magnifying glass, one of the things that comes to my mind is Sid the Science Kid. I have small children, so I'm very familiar with Sid the Science Kid. And when he says it's time to investigate, I know what that means and my kids know what it means. And that means to explore our world, not just take it as it is, but to discover those things that are unknown. I know my kids, we go out in our backyard and we have come up with a segment called Backyard Adventures. And we go out in the backyard and we look for bugs and we will have um, our iPads and I'll have my iPhone and we'll create videos and I'll put some music to it later, but we're filming anything that we see outside and we're making observations as we're doing that. So we want to encourage kids to become involved in the world and look and see and explore. And that's one of the things that I always think about when I think about uh, STEM or STEAM. And then also we want to encourage that collaboration. Collaboration is very important now and it will be in the future. You have to be able to work with others and see others points of view and be able to share information because no one person knows it all. Someone else can add something to it that, can, that we might not have even considered. So we want to be able to foster that collaboration in our students. And I know we've all had group assignments and some didn't go as well as we wanted them to go, but still we have to be able to collaborate. And that's what STEM and STEAM allows us to be able to do and also allows our children to be able to do that as well. And whenever you think about STEAM, I know when I think about it, I always think about there's some kind of technology involved. There's going to be some kind of computer. There's going to be some kind of programming going on. There's going to be some kind of software, whatever it's going to be used within the STEM, STEAM environment. And there's so many different things to um, go into STEAM. So I saw this picture of this lady and it looks like she's looking at, looks like crops or something, but still it allows us to imagine the possibilities that we may not have been able to think about as well as modeling. So that's kind of what I get out of this particular picture. And so when we think about STEAM, it helps us to answer the WH questions as well as the H questions as well. How? How does something operate? How does something do that? Also, it helps us to determine the why. Why do the clouds look the way they do before it gets ready to rain? Why does a bird uh, fly away when we want to get close to it? Things of that nature. What? What is something made of? The best way to figure out how something works is to take it apart and try to put it back together. And that's what STEM helps us to be able to do is to answer those what questions. And then also who, 
who did this before? We even considered doing it. What did their research say? What did they find? And that's a good tool for our children and children in the classroom to be able to understand who did it before we decided to do it and what did they uh, what did their findings show? And then the when, when was it done? And when should it be done again? So STEM helps us to answer all these particular uh, questions that we have about the world in which we live. I'm gonna check the chat to make sure I'm not missing anything, any questions or anything before I proceed on. Okay, I don't see anything. I'm gonna go ahead and proceed on. And some interesting careers that we may not have considered um, for our particular uh, students, as well as our own children. Information security analysts, every time you turn around, something has been hacked and our credit information has been uh, compromised. So there's always going to be a need for information security analysts. And but if our students and our children don't see any information security analysts, they won't know what this is. So it's always good to be able to present these uh, careers to children so that they know that they exist. A nurse anesthetist, <coughs> uh, actuary, a physician, a veterinarian, which we all know the veterinarian and the physician, uh, the software developer, uh, the dentist, and the psychologist. So these are all kind of the common STEM careers that kids um, know about. And then here are some STEAM careers, the astronaut, the pilot, graphic designers. Right now, there's a lot of uh, graphic designers that are doing, uh, it kind of goes hand in hand with the video game developer, as well as the animators. We have a lot of uh, people doing animation right now, and that's really hot. We also have the mechanical and civil engineers, as well as the sports announcer, which I really didn't think was a STEAM career, but we'll take it. Now, here's a quote that I found by Will I Am. I chose this because my youngest son's name is William, so kind of fits here. But Will I Am said, I'm trying to encourage kids to do something that isn't yet on their mind because it is not in popular culture. Popular culture tells you music, music, sports, sports. It neglects the importance of a STEM education. So STEM is not something that should be thought of as a afterthought, it should be incorporated with every other subject that we are teaching uh, children because it fits in and it is applicable to everything that we do in our lives. And so now I have some STEM examples that I'm gonna show you for everyday life. And some of these are actually, well, a lot of these I have done with my sons. And we have enjoyed them and learned a lot from them as well. And so one of the things that we all know about is the sun. And the sun is our greatest heat source. And we get solar energies that can power many of things now. It can even power our homes. And there are miniature solar cars that you can build with uh, children and actually put out in the sun and have, have it to charge. And then the car will move based on the energy produced by the sun. Now, one of the experiments that my sons and I did is we created a solar oven. I'm sorry to do it with to you with these marshmallows and graham crackers, but this was a very good experiment. And what we did is we took a pizza box and we cut it open, I cut it open, and I put some plastic on it and some aluminum foil and some dark uh, construction paper. And so just like your regular oven, I had to put it out in the sun to preheat it. 
And so this experiment works really good during the summertime. Our deck is mostly sun and it gets very, very hot. The temperature of this box reached about 130 degrees Fahrenheit, if I'm not mistaken. I used the little candy thermometer to check the uh, temperature in there. And so it takes a while for it to work, but the marshmallows are the first thing that uh, melt, but it takes a long time. It, it, the whole experiment takes about, let's say two and a half to three hours, but it's worth it to show the power of of the sun and its ability to generate heat and help us to cook. And so we did the marshmallows first, and then we put the chocolate in. And so my sons, they were excited to see the process and to see the marshmallows melt and the chocolate melt. But the most important part that they enjoyed were the finished product was eating the s'mores and I have to admit that was the fun part but they got to see the process of how the sun produces energy to be able to um, make s'mores and so every summer we, we kind of do this and so they'll say s'mores let's do s'mores and so we bring out the solar oven and we'll cook our s'mores on the deck. Now, another project that is a good project to do because there's so much involved in it when you're learning is gardening. You can do uh, self-contained uh, um, gardening. You can do, um, what do they call it, container gardening. And you can get the seeds from like the Dollar Tree. I've got some before they usually go pretty fast. So I, I picked up some. And so this helps students to be able to see the scientific process in action. They get to see, okay, we're starting with soil, we've got seeds, they get to track how long is it going to take for these seeds to germinate and poke through the soil. They can track it, they can create a graph. They can even create a video. We do this as well, where we document it. And every day we look, we water, we have a, um, a water meter that we stick down into the soil to see if the soil is still moist. And so there's so much STEM in gardening. And you can also, it's not only an outside project, it's an inside project as well. And kids get so much out of seeing something grow from nothing. And so it's inexpensive as well. So this is definitely a good way that we see STEM actually in our everyday lives. Now for STEAM, now there's stop motion animation. And what stop motion animation is, is when you take a uh, object, we'll just say like a toy dinosaur, and you put it up against a background and you take various uh, shots of it. And there's apps that you can use to combine all of your shots so that once you are finished, it looks like these objects are actually moving. And so it's very creative. I've seen some that have just really blown my socks off. And so stop motion animation is one of those things that can easily be incorporated into the classroom as well as at home because everyone nowadays has a tablet or a phone with a camera on it. And so it's easy to come up with some kind of uh, movie with some kind of plot and make it almost like one of the Godzilla movies, so to speak. And so you just have to use creativity. And that's one of the things we want to encourage, not only 
in uh, kids in the classroom, but our kids as well. Use your creativity. Think outside of the box and use the tools that you have and even some of the tools that you don't have to be able to come up with something that is kind of out of the box. And so that's another way that you can actually uh, incorporate STEM and, well, STEAM into your classroom. Now, here's another one. With technology, and as we've seen with the pandemic, where we all had to kind of stay to ourselves and keep our distance, and there is a lot of virtual uh, events that are going on. And so now in our classrooms, whereas before we had to kind of bring the, the people in physically, now we can invite them in virtually. And that's where Skype a scientist comes in. And so with Skype a scientist, they have all types of scientists from zoologists to veterinarians, you name it, they, they pretty much have it, computer scientists. And for a small donation of about $15, you can actually request to have a scientist to actually speak to your class. And you can also have them, it's not only just for education, it's also uh, at home as well. And so this is a great way for students to be able to get up close and personal with someone that is in a uh, STEAM career and get firsthand knowledge of what it's like to be a particular scientist. And so I found out about Skype, a scientist through a uh, educator that I am working with. I'm working on a STEM project through uh, Science Atlanta. I'm in Georgia and I'm working with a uh, STEM educator. And so her class is, trying to come up with a solution to a problem that they have. And the problem is, is that one of the exit doors that they go out of floods, the area outside the door floods when it rains. And so they, they can't go out that door. They have to go out another door. So they're trying to come up with creative solutions for this particular uh, problem. And so they're Skyping a scientist. We actually applied for a small $200 grant that we were able to get, and we were able to purchase a drone. So the students are going to learn how to fly the drone over the area, and we're coming up with creative ways to be able to handle this uh, flooding. And we're talking with a lot of experts and they're documenting their findings. So there's a lot of uh, back and forth with scientists. And so it's just a great way to get that firsthand knowledge in your classroom without having to physically invite somebody in when you might not be able to. So if you have not used Skype a scientist, I would highly encourage you to do so. Now, this is my favorite, virtual field trips. Now, I like a regular field trip. I really do. But since the pandemic, my sons and I have had to do a lot of virtual field trips, and we have gotten a lot of information and education out of these field trips. And so the zoo, now we go to our uh, Atlanta Zoo here, but also we go to the virtual zoo. And here are some of my favorites. Now the San Diego Zoo, they have their live cams on. And so if you happen to be talking about um, mammals or particular um, science area, habitats, uh, eating habits and things of that nature, you know, you can incorporate a lot of this into the curriculum. And so a lot of zoos today have their virtual cams on and you can see a lot of different uh, things and you can ask your students questions and have them to do uh, book reports. Uh, my children use uh, 
the book creator app and they'll create their little stories. And so it's just a great way to think outside of the box. If you can't get to a physical zoo, you can always get to a virtual zoo. And the same goes for the aquarium. Uh, we have the Georgia Aquarium here and they also have a uh, live cam where we get to see the uh, penguins and other aquatic animals. And so that really helps out a lot. And then the Monterey Bay Aquarium, they have their live cams with the jellyfish and all types of things. And so we're exploring different worlds just virtually and you're giving a different perspective and a different outlook on Number one, some of the things that you might not be able to see, but now you can because of these live cams. So we definitely need to take advantage of these as the teaching tools that they are. And one of my favorites is the Amazon Fulfillment Center. Now, if you are like me, the Amazon van seems like it stays in front of our house. <laughs> at least once, at least every day. I try not to, but I love Amazon and I know I'm not alone. And so wouldn't it be good for students to actually see what goes on in the fulfillment center before that package ends up on their doorstep? Well, with the Amazon fulfillment tours, you can see it. And I have been on this virtual tour and I learned a lot about how the packages actually end up in the boxes, how it's taped up, how the label gets put on it, uh, the robotics that are involved within the warehouse and how it goes down the uh, assembly line. It is fascinating and it's free. And so if you have not checked out the Amazon Fulfillment Center tours, I would highly encourage you to check those out with your students because everybody needs to know how does that box, what goes into the process of getting that box to my doorstep? And I was, I was very surprised at what I saw in that, in that tour and they take questions. So if you've got questions, they've got answers. And so that is another way for us to be able to show students how STEM is actually incorporated within something simple, just as ordering, a, uh, ordering an item from Amazon and having it delivered to uh, your home. Now here's my favorite and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm apologizing for this. I have not had lunch, so I do apologize for this. Uh, ice cream in a bag. If you have not done this experiment, oh my goodness, you must try it. And it does not involve a lot of ingredients. There's salt and then there's ice and then there's milk. And I think that's I think that's it. But my sons and I, we did this particular experiment, and I I didn't really think it was going to turn into uh, ice cream. But the more we shook the bag, the more the ice cream actually started to form. And we made vanilla ice cream in a bag. So this shows us how we can take some simple ingredients to make a new creation and that ice cream doesn't necessarily have to come in that carton that we get from the store. And if you run out, then, hey, you can make your own ice cream in a bag and add some sprinkles or some hot fudge. I might be going a little too far, but you get the idea. You can make ice cream at home. And so, and that's a lot of STEM involved there. You know, you've got the science of how something goes from uh, liquid to solid, and then the time that's involved, as well as the force, uh, the shaking of the bag. So there's a lot of STEM that just goes into this uh, ice cream uh, in a bag. And so it was 
Yes, it's a well, it was regular milk. And then it was, if I'm not mistaken, like uh, kosher salt. But I'll, I'll have to, I can uh, provide the uh, recipe or you can Google. But it's, it's very simple what, what you need for this uh, ice cream in a bag. And it's delicious, by the way. So if you haven't tried it, I'd highly encourage you to do so. And our next, NASA, who has not been glued to your television when the uh, space shuttle is getting ready to launch? I know all of us have, and we've been sitting on the edge of our seats. And so this is a great way to incorporate STEAM. And if you have not downloaded the NASA app, I would highly encourage you to do so because it is awesome. You can include all of their, um, they've got videos, they've got books, they've got other resources that you can incorporate into your science curriculum or your technology, whatever you're looking for, it is there. And then you can actually watch as they're preparing for launches. So this is a good resource to use as well. And then they also have uh, NASA at home. It lets you bring it to your home. And it is good as well because as I uh, mentioned a couple of slides back, they have that virtual tour. So many of us may, may or may not get an opportunity to physically visit NASA, but with their virtual tours, we can. And so we can get a inside look into what it is like to be a scientist at NASA. And then they've got their podcast, they've got uh, videos. Uh, you can see what it is to be a scientist. And then they've got their eBooks and then uh, even items for families. So NASA is a great STEAM resource to be able to use and just to get kids curious and to use their imagination. And so not only with NASA, I know we've seen a lot of space uh, exploration going on, well, kind of going up, coming back down with um uh, Elon Musk with his, uh, I forget the name of the, con uh, the company, Blue Origin, I think it's called. And then uh, Jeff Bezos of Amazon has his uh, company. So, you know, they go, they go up and they come back down. But at least with NASA, you get to be able to get a little bit more uh, detailed information as to what it is like to be in space and to stay in space. And so that gives kids a insight and some uh, students may want to be an astronaut, but don't know what they need to do in order to be an astronaut and what kind of subjects they need to study. So this NASA at home is a great uh, resource to have as well. Now here, when I saw this, I knew I had to put this in my slides because Number one, I couldn't, I couldn't believe that it was real when I saw it. And then number two, I was like, the, the scientist in me, I was like, okay, I have to get the backstory on this cow with these virtual reality glasses on. And so I did some, uh, research, uh, some researching and this was in the New York Post. And so the story behind this cow with these virtual reality glasses on is that the cows were inside for the winter. And so going back to our WH questions, someone, a veterinarian decided that, hey, the inside environment during the winter is causing the cows to be unhappy. They're not as happy as they would be if they were outside. They felt that the cows were stressed. And so they did, and I'm gonna provide some, some more information so you see where I'm going with this. So they 
uh, did some research and they decided that, hey, let's put these virtual reality glasses on the cow and let them see themselves outside in a green pasture. And so that's what the cow sees in the virtual reality glasses. Well, the research came back and said and showed that the cows were happier once they were placed, uh, the, once the virtual reality glasses were placed on the cows and the milk production went from like 5.9 gallons to seven gallons. So they produced more milk because they were happier and they, because they thought they were outside and they were less stressed. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. So if, it, if virtual reality glasses can do that for cows, just think about what it could do for us. And so, you know, I got to break mine out and I'll imagine myself somewhere if it's going to help reduce some stress. But, you know, the technology that's involved in this and the actual tracking to see that this actually works, I would have never in my life imagined a cow with some virtual reality glasses on. But scientifically, it works because the cow the cows produce more milk. Go figure. But see, these are the type of things that STEM allows us to do. Like the veterinarian, I don't know how or why the veterinarian thought of putting the vir the virtual reality glasses on the cow, but I I would assume that he or she had read something by. Maybe someone else had done it. That goes back to the who when uh, I talked about earlier in the presentation. And so decided, hey, let's give it a try. And based on that, they got their answer that, hey, if you put the cows with the virtual reality glasses on in a environment where they think they're outside, they are going to produce more milk. Go figure. Science is a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing, and sometimes it makes you laugh at some of the things that that come out of our assumptions, our hypothesis. But you know, that's that's all a part of it. Coming up with something new because you have a thought and you go and you prove it. And so here are some STEM resources that I like to use. And you know, Netflix can be educational, not just for us binge watching shows, but there are actually some educational worthy shows on Netflix. And uh, the first one is Ada Twist Scientist. And uh, there's a little girl that is a scientist. And so again, this is geared towards our young girls trying to get them into the STEM world and let them see what's involved. And then there's Emily's Wonder Lab, where Emily does all these different experiments in her lab. And so that is a good one as well. And then I like documentaries and I particularly like Picture a Scientist because this particular documentary, it documents the lives of many women scientists and they talk about their journey in the STEM field. And they talk about the good, the bad and the ugly. And so it needs to be talked about because you don't want uh, anyone to think that, hey, everything in STEM is just glorious and, and rosy, which it is not. And so this would be good for students to actually see uh, from a woman's perspective what women go through in STEM fields. And so it's about an hour and a half long, but it's very it's, it's not a slow kind of boring documentary once you start it just keeps pulling you further, further in until you get to the end. So if you haven't seen it, I would highly encourage that uh, you show it to your students or even show it to your children to let them see what 
a scientist actually is and some of the challenges that a scientist goes through. And me being a computer scientist, and as was mentioned earlier, I have written eight books. I didn't put all eight books up here, but these are kind of the, I went from a self-published to a published author. And so I do write uh, kind of technology. I focus on the T in the STEM. And these are just two of my books that I have written for uh, A-Press uh, Media. And I'm working on the ninth book. So um, people joke with me and tell me I don't sleep. And so that's kind of that's somewhat true. You know, I, I'm kind of a night owl. And then when I can't take it anymore, I go to sleep. But, you know, this just gets us to see that you can incorporate STEM in just about anything. And you can encourage uh, students and your children to be authors. And you can be authors that focus on a particular STEM uh, topic. I focus on the technology aspect of STEM. And so there's, there's always some kind of way that we can incorporate STEM and STEAM into our everyday lives. Let me check the uh, chat here. Uh, I don't see any questions. Let me go. And so I want to kind of wrap it up with this particular quote here by Rosalind Franklin that I feel kind of gets to the essence of what STEM and STEAM are. It basically says that science and everyday life cannot and should not be separated. And as I have pointed out in all the different areas and the examples that I've gone through, you see STEM and STEAM are so intertwined into our daily lives that it just makes sense to not separate them. A lot of times we talk about STEM as if as if it is just a separate subject, but no, it incorporates all of the subjects. Not only, you know, you got your science and technology, engineering, math, but they all come together. And our students need to know that. And so um, we have to do kind of a better job of showing that. And we can always, as I said, with the Skype of scientists, bring in the scientists to just kind of further prove that, you know, everyday life and science are not separate, they're intertwined. And so the more we can get our students to realize that and our children to realize that, oh, what unstoppable creatures they will be. And so here's my contact information and I'll put it also in the chat. If you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, you can feel free to do so. You know, I love connecting with new people and, you know, we could talk about just about anything. You know, I, I like STEM, but I, I like a lot of other things too. Entrepreneurship, cooking, all that good stuff. And so I thank you for being so attentive and uh, being engaging in the chat, and I'm going to uh, stop sharing. If anyone has any questions, I'll take those now. Let I think we're all going to have like memories of your virtual reality cow. <laughs> no. <laughs> <clears throat> and I have one of those headsets downstairs, so I'm wondering if it works on dogs. I put it on my dog. Hey, if if what's his name Mas Maslow, if Maslow could come up with the hierarchy of needs with dogs, you know, it's like I think he's the one that did that. But anyway, That's just so funny. You know, hey, who knows what virtual reality glasses <laughs> on a dog could do? So we do have our um, guest librarian, and that's about ten minutes. So I'm thinking if it's okay, we do your question and answer in the chat. If you okay, that's on. fine. Um, Dr. Sims, and then you guys can keep the chat going. But meanwhile, um, <clears throat> just a reminder that tomorrow's session, we will have Dr. Teresa Handy here, and she will be using literature and books to spark um, courageous conversations in the classroom and sharing some resources on diversity and inclusion. 
Um, right now, I'm going to share a presentation from our librarian, our guest librarian, Sally Nye, who's going to go over some great resources to incorporate this week during Read Across America. So I will share my screen and start that. I'm thinking you can't hear that, can you? Hang on one second. Let me do that one more time. Okay, here we go. Sorry about that. Here we go. What are youngest readers in the library and what to use during this fun week of reading to make it inclusive and fun for everybody. Michelle, we're not seeing the video. And in the yeah, end, okay. Read Across yeah. America began. I'm back to this. Hey, he just was so creative and brief. Well, then I am not sure what I'm doing wrong. I'm going to start it over. We were seeing a different screen, just not the screen of the video. Perfect. Okay. I'll try this one again. Sorry about this, everyone. Happy Read Across America, everybody. Welcome to Burlington, Wisconsin. My name is Sally Nye, and I'm the librarian here. So welcome to Librarian Corner. Today, we're talking about our youngest readers in the library and what to use during this fun week of reading to make it inclusive and fun for everybody. Um, in 1998, Read Across America began on Dr. Seuss's birthday because he just was so creative in bringing early liter literacy to our students. We can certainly still celebrate him, but now we can expand past that to all the new authors that are working to include all of our students. Um, today, I'm going to talk about a couple sections of the library that you're going to want to check out for some great new books. The first of those are Theodore Seuss Geisel Award winners. Now we have an award based off of Dr. Seuss to award all of our new authors that are doing fabulous work. And one of my favorite new authors is Mo Willems. I kind of call him the new Dr. Seuss because he has so many great resources made, the pigeon books and Knuffle Bunny and his award-winning um, Piggy and Elephant books. These were some, I think this is the most celebrated series in the Theodore Seuss Geisel Award winner books. Um, he has about five or six winner books there and kids love these because they have the speech bubbles and they learn how to do exclamations and learn how to bury their voice and they learn to create dialogue before they can even read. Um, something that's been really fun with this series is although Mo Willems has stopped creating them, the books haven't stopped. Other authors are picking them up in the Piggy and Elephant like reading books. And we can see that Piggy and Elephant are so excited to get a brand new book to read and they share it with us, the reader. And once again, they're books that have that dialogue and the kids can have a lot of fun with it. So be sure to look for these as well. On that same stream, we have two friends in those books and a lot of our Theodore Seuss Geisel award-winning books do have two friends. So we have Snail and Worm, Cowgirl Kate and Coco, the girl and her talking horse, Mouse and Mole, Pearl and Wagner, Zelda and Ivy. And they're all in that same stream of frog and toad from our youth. Just that fun banter between friends that kids really love to pick up on. Um, some other types of books that have won that Theodore Seuss Geisel Award. We have some early graphic novels. We know how much our kids love graphic novels, but they're a little tricky to read at first. So things such as Benny and Penny really give that early visual literacy, teaching kids how to read that format of graphic novel. And another fun per person is Selena Yoon, who has My Kite is Stuck. And so on that same graphic novel format. Some other people to look for, Otto the Robot, Ties Travels, and this fun series, A Pig, A Fox, and a Box for our youngest readers. Just have a fun way to learn those early rhyming, early words in a really fun, silly way with Fox and Pig. 
So check out some of those for our earliest readers. Now, some other books that have won the Theodore Seuss Bezel Award are people such as Greg Pizzoli, who's made some fun books such as The Watermelon Seed, where this alligator is sure that a watermelon's going to grow in his stomach. He's never going to eat watermelon again, or is he? <laughs> Someone else to check out is Kevin Hankus from my home um, state of Wisconsin. So in this one, we have that topic of waiting, which is so hard for kids, and they can just see how different people handle that waiting and what they're waiting for. Um, he has so many great award-winning books. This one, Where's Baby? I love this one. It came out last year, and this dad loves to play this game of Where's the Baby? And we can clearly see the baby in every picture, but that dad has a fun time playing pretend, and in the end, they decide to do it again. So I love those books that depict how to play and how to work together um, and just bringing that home for kids. Um, we have this series of I Am Not Small and We Are Not Friends that um, is really silly from Anna King. And if your kids have a wicked sense of humor, make sure you check out I Want My Hat Back by John Classen. This bear does not like being lied to. And in the end, you might have to really think about what really has happened. Um, a lot of my students don't quite get the end until we talk about it a little bit. <laughs> um, some books that are not award-winning books but are so fun to use are books such as Tap to Play um, by Selena Yoon. This one we have to help the little dot get up to the top bar and we try circling him, we try tipping the book, we try putting it upside down. We do all kinds of things to get him where he belongs in the book. And Henry Toule is another excellent author to check out. All of his books are so immersive. If we, it tells us what to do. And once we do it, something happens. So just showing the cause and effect. And I almost think early coding. So if we talk about computer coding, we're, we're looking for patterns and rhythms. So ready? And we say press here. If we press it, and it creates another dot. So it's press it again. So I press it, and we ask kids, what's going to happen? It's going to make another dot. And now if I rub it, what's going to happen? Something else happens. And if I rub the other one, what's going to happen? Ooh, something a little bit different, but kind of the same. And five taps on the yellow. One, two, three, four, five. <gasps> and if I do that on the red, is the same thing going to happen? One, two, three, four, five. Kids love learning the patterns and what's and thinking about what's going to happen, the whole prediction. Um, another author that I really like is Britta Teckentrup, and their, her stories are very immersive. So we're trying to not wake up that tiger. Each animal has to try to get across, but each one's a little bit different. Some have long legs, some can fly, some are light enough to float. So what's going to work the best for each of them to not wake up that tiger? So hopefully they do not. <laughs> um, so with that, there is another award that I love to talk about with my youngest readers this time of year as well. And that is the Caldecott Award for the best pictures. And I always love to do a prediction with them where we read a lot of books and they vote for which one they think is going to win the award for having the best pictures that fit the text best. Um, I love to show them one that has one in the past, Last Stop on Market Street, one of my favorite winter books. Um, this one actually won three awards. We talk about how some books can get more than one award. Um, this year, there are some fantastic books that the kids really gravitated towards. Outside Inside was a great reflection on the pandemic and how all of a sudden we found ourselves inside and life was really different. And through it, we just really remember all those things like not being able to go on playgrounds and having to be, not be able to see our grandparents and how all of a sudden the summer inside became outside and we got to see everybody again. I'll have to admit I had a few tears, a couple teachers and I had a few tears over this one. <laughs> um, if you're really looking at different careers for your students, this one's fabulous. It talks about those jobs that we don't really talk about very often. So we talk about the architect, 
but then we need the builders and how they all work together. So people making roller coasters, making bridges, making fountains, all sorts of fun things. Um, one of the kids' absolute favorite this year, I was talking about, why am I not holding it this way? It's this way, Mel Fowl. And Mel is a bird who's very confident. She's decided it's her day to fly. So she looks down and she falls. And the people in the tree, look at those shocked owls. They don't know what to do with that. So she falls and falls and the kids never expect what's going to happen. They say, oh no. And we predict what's going to happen. You'll have to pick up the book. You don't expect it. I did not. <laughs> um, speaking of outdoors, Wonder Walkers is a fabulous book. You can go on in and these kids are deciding, should we go for a Wonder Walk? They go out and they say, is the sun the world's light bulb? Is the fog the river's blanket? And they just ask those what if questions in beautiful collage pictures. The kids really like this one. Um, one of my favorites for teachers is Hurricane. If your class is a little crazy, pull out this book. Every crazy class settled right down and is totally immersed in the story of how a hurricane came to this boy's town. And it's by John Rocco, who does a lot of beautiful, beautiful books. Um, the actual winner this year was Watercress, talking about a girl who doesn't know much about her mom's Chinese background and is a little embarrassed about being embarrassed about her family. One to leave you with is Off Limits, about a dad who does not want his daughter in his office. And she might get a little carried away in that office. <laughs> and the end results might be a little different than you expect. I hope you saw some literature that looked interesting to you, and I hope you have a fabulous Read Across America week. And if you would like another look at some of those resources, check this site out, bit.ly 35FWMSS. Okay, thank you for attending everyone. We ran a couple minutes over. So um, just want to thank you for your <laughs> And um, we will see you hopefully tomorrow at two o'clock for Dr. Handy's presentation on inclusion diversity. Um, have a great day, everyone.